Welcome to the Huddle, the podcast where coaches of all levels share their views on basketball and coaching with you. Today we have a foreign coach, and it's none other than Tom Newell, an American coach who has shared his passion about basketball all over the world. Thanks for listening and enjoy the huddle. Hello, hi coaches. Welcome to a new episode of The Huddle. Uh, it's uh, episode number 10, so it means that we introduce a foreign coach uh, again today. And we have the honor of uh, introducing to you a coach with a, a well-filled career. Um, the coach has been working in the NBA, the double NBA. He has been working for national teams, both in and outside Europe, uh, in the NBA and double NBA. He has been working as a scout as an assistant coach, as a head coach, as a director of player personnel, et cetera, et cetera, has been working in the States, in Belgium, Ireland, Korea, um, <laughs> Russia, Spain, Venezuela. I think it would be easier, coach, if I name all the countries where you didn't work. I think that list will be shorter. <laughs> Thank you. I'm coach Tom, how are you doing? How was the introduction? Was it okay? Anything you want to add? Uh, don't, don't you well. That was very good. <laughs> I like it. I like things short. Yeah, keep it simple. Amen. No, how are you doing, Coach? Where are you calling? I'm doing from? very well, thank you. I, I'm really excited to be here in, in uh, Belgium and uh, to be working with uh, Game Within the Game Project. Tom, uh, Coach Tom Johnson, who is the coach in Hotala with the uh, uh, second division uh, women's team. A great teacher, uh, much experience uh, in Europe, and also with uh, NBA team Oklahoma City and uh, Orlando Magic, and uh, is a very good representative for growing the game, uh, especially after COVIDness. Yeah, that's correct, and it's good that you mentioned Tom Johnson because he was uh, a guest in our show a few weeks ago in uh, last season, and he was the coach who gave me who got me in touch with you coach i really appreciate it so if coach tom is watching right now thanks tom for the introduction with uh, with uh, coach tom Yule. um and coach you said that you're in belgium right now uh, if i'm correct you're in fleurus can you tell a little bit what you're doing in fleurus at the moment yes uh well i'm hoping to be able this is where i began my career professionally uh, first as a player and then uh, became a uh, a player coach uh, after the, uh, uh, the president, Andre Robert, the late Andre Robert, uh, made a, a change in Jacques de Koenig, a very nice uh, gentleman and a good teacher. But uh, I don't know what happened. Uh, it was after two, three weeks, and uh, I get a call. Not a call. They knocked on my door. I don't speak Wallon. I get a call uh, uh, on my door, and it's Andre, and it's with the interpreter who happened to be at the time a, uh, a Belgian uh, Brussels uh, college student. And uh, he translated very well. And he said that uh, Monsieur Robert would like you to be the new coach. Okay. And I, I was like, uh, okay, can you tell me why? And, and uh, evidently he and uh, De Koenig uh, did not get along uh, for whatever reason. And so I asked the other American who was uh, Greg Nelson at the time, our center, 6'8", and uh, asked him what he thought about that. And he said he had no problem as long as he got 20 shots a game. So uh, I designed a, an offense that would allow him to touch the ball on all the out-of-bounds plays that we had on the sideline and under the basket so that the analytics after the game, hey, you got 25 shots. <laughs> so, there, we had no problems. We went from the uh, second division <laughs> excuse me, to the uh, first division. Uh, and uh, I returned uh, as a uh, player coach. They made another coaching change and then I took over again. Uh, but the club did not uh, bring in new, new, uh, new uh, skilled players. We had the same players from the second division. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you know, as well as I do, you can't, uh, JV players cannot compete with premier players. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we could have gotten Willie Steveniers, I would have been really happy, really happy. Uh, he's one of my all-time favorite uh, basketball players that I've ever seen in basketball. And uh, at the time, for me, he was the uh, premier uh, basketball uh, example for guards in uh, Belgium. Okay. Well, that's a nice story, Coach. Thanks for sharing and coach, yeah, you mentioned it, you're in Belgium right now, and uh, I think you can see that uh, life is slightly getting back to normal in, in Belgium. 
after a, yeah, uh, a long situ COVID situation. Um, and it's crazy to realize how it affected our lives uh, in Belgium, but also abroad. How did you experience the whole COVID situation? Well, I've, I've given this a lot of thought and uh, probably more thought than most coaches uh, at any level, pro or uh, amateur, mm -hmm. uh, Mike and, and, and uh, Gunner. The, the biggest problem that I have seen is that the coaches, uh, not only were they suspended from their activity, but the children, uh, the participants and the players uh, were not allowed. This is in America and also in Hong Kong, uh, where I've taught several times in the Philippines and uh, also in, in Micronesia, where they uh, did not allow people to come in for over 16 months. They had no tourists. And, uh, and then also in South America, uh, you know, in Guyana uh, and Japan uh, and China. And so everybody was affected. OK, and, and by that, I'm saying the children most of all, because they did not understand what COVID was mm -hmm. in their young minds. They did not understand the science behind the 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 uh, uh, Im impact, you know, of, of daily life. They uh, were not going to school. They were being taught online something new other than playing video games and e-games uh, and watching videos. Uh, and, and now there's, there's a new level of, of learning. And so coaches were really impacted because they did not have the the team organization. They did not have the structure that would allow them to develop uh, the players and the fundamentals and the practices, whether it's one, one practice for two hours a week or uh, two or three practices for an hour a week. So uh, everybody was affected, but nobody really stayed in contact with the young players. And when that happens, then you, you develop bad habits. There are only two habits in basketball. Do you know what they are? Good and bad. Hey, there you go. And there are only two ways you can play the game. Oh, the right way and the wrong way. <laughs> so if I dribble the ball with my head down, is that a good habit or a bad habit? Bad. Yeah. Now, now, is that the right way or the wrong way? The wrong, the wrong way. way. Yeah. Now, now we have an understanding. Yeah. So this segues into my philosophy that it's a simple game until coaches put players in a position to fail because they did not teach them properly. Mm -hmm. You understand? Yeah. Right. yeah. And if you played the game, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. So for me, all right, I keep the game very simple. I learned that from my father. He, uh, uh, I heard him always talk about the two philosophies in basketball, simplicity and execution. And then the other is uh, the coach that, uh, is always changing, all right, the offense, the defense, and a distraction. I call them screamers, not dreamers. And so when you have that, and you, you know from your own experiences, and I've seen it all over the world, you have coaches that aren't teachers, but will always yell at players during a game when they make a mistake. And the player, of course, is looking to the side, distracted, all right, and then wondering if the coach is going to make a substitution. So already the player is not going to be an effective uh, offensive player or defensive player because of the emotions of the coach. And so that, that is why it's so important coming out of COVID that we get back into the alphabet of basketball. Do you know what the alphabet of basketball is? No. no. It's, it's fun, uppercase F-U-N, lowercase I-N, Dementals, D-A-M-E-N-T-A-L-S, fun and dementals. And so coaches must go back and they must uh, understand their teaching philosophy. If they don't have a teaching philosophy, then here I am. I can help every coach understand what it is to be a teacher first and a coach second. The same with Tom Johnson. This is why we want to take my program, Caretakers of the Game International, and uh, implement it uh, with the game within the game here in Belgium. To keep things simple for the coaches, not to judge, not to uh, point fingers, but to open the mind. Uh, I call the mind in basketball the soil. <clears throat> and so when coaches like myself who are teachers come back and, and give back from their experiences, 
And I probably, this is not my ego because my ego is not my amigo. This is probably why I, I am so, uh, at my age, I am so uh, actively pursuing wanting to give back and serve to coaches like yourself to grow the game. Yeah, you're, you're really right that it's so important to get the uh, fundamentals and uh, the basics back. Uh, I just coached a, a game and for me, it's really difficult. My my team, they, they don't have the the, the basics. They, they don't have it. And really, sometimes I think, okay, I can complain, but maybe I have because I do do now I do have a U21 team. So it's it's the, the step before to go to the to the um, um, how do you say it? Uh, you know, a team with uh, the, the big guys. Right. So maybe I'm, I'm thinking about now for me for going taking back a step to the U12 or U14 to to teach them back the basics. And there you go. That's yeah, outstanding. I can, yeah, I can complain and say, oh, I have to. I have to wait and they have to do it. No, maybe I have to do it by myself. So I don't think so. I, I think what you could do that would really help you is if you were to give your players a one page <coughs> questionnaire mm -hmm. and in that page, you ask them over the last 16 months before they came to you as a, a team member, how many of them practice on their own? <coughs> Excuse me, ball handling shooting free throws, making layups mm -hmm. per week, per day. Yeah, that's true. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then the other, the other thing to that is uh, ask them if they played any one-on-one, -on -one, two on two, or three and three. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me, I have uh, allergies. No problem. I, I think I'm no allergic problem. to Zoom. Uh, <laughs> but I, I, think, I think if you, What, what I try to tell the coaches when they come back off of COVID is they're going to see two uh, <coughs> players that have not practiced or played or been in the structure of an organization, which creates the behavior and the discipline. Mm -hmm. And so the best thing a coach can do is basically put teams into three on three and uh, just watch them and then make notes of the players that have confidence in being able to pass and being able to dribble the ball mm -hmm. and shoot. And, and then, <clears throat> and you don't make any corrections. You just watch, let them play, let them yeah. express themselves for the first time being with their friends. And, and what that does is that that releases them from having to impress you that, Hey, I can play, I can touch the net and I can touch the rim, but that doesn't say anything about being able to pass and cut set a screen All right, mm -hmm. uh, move without the ball, uh, be able to offensive rebound, to finish, uh, to shoot free throws and what have you. So three and three, uh, which is now an Olympic sport, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, Belgium uh, did very well in the Olympics in the first competition that they had. And I foresee that, that Belgium will end up uh, being in the finals again in four years or two years, whenever they decide to have the Olympics again without COVID. Uh, but I think if, we, if you look at that as a model, uh, Mike and Gunnar, I, I think that young coaches would be able to better understand the difference between coaching and teaching. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, that's the main thing, yeah, because uh, we see a lot of, we always talk about great coaches, good, bad, good coaches, but We don't talk about great teachers that much. And that's something no. we would like to highlight even more. And that it's great that you are here. And, and I love the, the thing that you said, uh, that you're happy to be able to give back to the community of coaches. It means a lot to us, means a lot to all the coaches that are watching today. So thanks again, coach, for being here. Um, hey, hey uh, Gunnar, I, I, I tell you this, I'm 74 years old. And everything that I teach, I demonstrate. So when Mike shows up at that clinic, November 21st, it's going to blow him away because he's going to think I'm a, uh, a white man uh, that's come back as Bruce Lee. All right. Be like Wata. <laughs> <laughs> Great one. Great one. Um, coach, you know, as they always say, it's never a good thing to make assumptions. Um, so mm -hmm. 
my question. I don't know if it's an assumption or not, but yeah, if we hear the name of a of you all, I have a lot of people, a lot of coaches will quickly think about uh, your father, a uh, Hall of Fame coach, uh, Pete Newell. Um, is he the reason that you got into coaching? Uh, are there any other reasons? Uh, what no, I, I, you know, my, my father never uh, saw me play when I was in uh, middle school mm -hmm. in the uh, sixth, seventh and eighth grade because he was coaching at the time and recruiting. And so, uh, you know, there, there wasn't a lot of uh, time for him to uh, schedule, uh, you know, an observation or, or attending my uh, <clears throat> competitions. Mm -hmm. That didn't bother me. I was just so happy to be on a team, Gunner and Mike. I, I just, it was so exciting to me to have my friends that we could play together. <clears throat> I made a lot of mistakes, but we had fun. We got to ride our bike to practice. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we got to uh, ride home. So, yeah. When I got to high school, my father uh, saw me play. Maybe uh, he never saw me as a freshman or a junior varsity player the first two years. And then the last two years, he only saw me play maybe four times. <clears throat> and then when I was in college, he saw me play maybe a dozen times over four years. So, you know, but that didn't bother me because my teammates, And, and the, the good coaches that were teachers that I had gave me all the support that I needed. I didn't need to, to shoot a ball and it was an air ball and then look to the stands like, oh, did my dad see me shoot an air ball? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and my dad would be doing this like a lot of fathers do. Well, I didn't teach him that, you know. <laughs> and, and, then, and then looking over at, at the mother and the mother is uh, talking to another mother All right, during the game, completely missed the, uh, the, the air ball. And, and then I knew I was going to get <coughs> cookies and uh, milk after the game. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. No, no. I should have okay, taken coach. my uh, medicine for my allergies. Yeah, it's okay, coach. It's okay. Um, yeah, okay. No, good, great story. Great story about, about your, uh, your father and, and, and your mother. And But... But let me segue into, <clears throat> he was always open with his door for yeah. coaches and players to come visit. And I, I always, I never forgot that. It was always uh, <clears throat> an acknowledgement of respect because he was a teacher. One of the great quotes I've ever read in basketball by my father that I use as a foundation is that coaching lasts a practice It lasts a game, perhaps a season, yet teaching lasts a lifetime. And it's true. And that's the simplicity and the execution of being a teacher first and a coach second, Gunner and Mike. Yeah. Coach, when you start coaching, you, you ask some advice at your father or you discuss some things? Oh, yeah. When I got the job, Uh, to be the player coach in Flores, he was the general manager of the San Diego Rockets that are now the uh, Houston Rockets. And he told me, he said, Tommy, be yourself, only teach what you know and understand about the game. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know anything about zone defense. And that's always been my foundation for teaching. Uh, individual defense and team defense. And then as each year went by uh, and I grew with the game, when I uh, returned to California, I was a high school uh, varsity assistant coach, volunteered, and uh, also a, a seventh and eighth grade uh, elementary school coach. And then I worked on a cattle ranch. Uh, I was in charge of raising alfalfa. And now you can, you can imagine Here I am, a basketball, former basketball professional, and I'm riding a tractor, cutting the hay, all right, cutting the grass for cattle, all right? Mm -hmm. And I always, I always think back of, of that moment when I realized just whatever a man sows, <coughs> that shall he also reap. And I'm not a religious, <coughs> excuse me, I'm not a religious person, but I do believe that there's a higher source 
that uh, inspires us and protects us. The, the thing I, I, I've, it's very interesting what you say, never teach something you, you don't know about. This is really something important for young coaches. If you don't know about this and you just saw it on internet <laughs> or in a video, don't teach it because you first need to know everything about it before you can teach something. And that, this, that's, that's what a scientist does. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but it's something important. Some of the coaches forget. They, they just start uh, copying something without knowing why they do it. We, we already tell, tell this story several times in the podcast, but I'm really happy you tell it again uh, for the young coaches. Don't copy oh, something. Hey, Mike, that's a great, great reflection on your part. Yeah. I always remember my father saying, don't just coach. Don't, don't just teach, but teach the why. Mm -hmm. Because the, the person on the other end receiving the information, they, they, they see that, they hear that, but they don't understand why. Mm -hmm. And so they understand the how, <laughs> yeah. how to get there, but why to get there. So that means it's progressive. So when you uh, are on defense and I receive the ball, if I predetermine, well, it's my turn. <clears throat> I'm going to shoot now. And mm -hmm. I don't read how you're playing me forcing me over the top or forcing me uh, to the sideline base, then, then I make mistakes. Mm -hmm. And then the whole team suffers because I became an individual and not part of the sequence of a play. So that's a very good point, Gunnar. Uh, I mean, Michael, thank you for uh, sharing that. Yeah, it's just uh, that's, that's how I try to, to do my practices. Always tell them why to do something. If, if they know why, they're going to do it. If they don't exactly. know, why, they're going to, they don't know how to react in some situations. They, mm -hmm. And if they know, okay, I need to do this mm -hmm. because of this, they know it perfectly. Okay. It's, it's going to take a time and you have to do several times, but they're going to know it after a while. So that segues into this. I think it's very important coming out of COVID for youth coaches to have practice plans. And so I, uh, at my, uh, at our clinic that we're having November 21st, and I'm working at the international school, I'm passing out uh, practical cards, practice cards that I've given already to some coaches and they're just blown away with the simplicity, but it gives them an opportunity to, to visualize how they're going to teach. And so what's important, uh, and, and you, you bring this up, uh, 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 Mike, that, When you, have, when you have 10 players uh, and you only have an hour and a half or two hours practice twice a week, and you have players now that have gained weight, they're two years older, uh, they haven't practiced, they haven't competed, they don't know the new rule changes because the coach doesn't have time to teach it. Uh, and the coach feels that, well, that's not my responsibility. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. If you, if you as a teacher, Can, can introduce combination drills. So like when you shoot free throws, you, you have players occupy the lane. So they become defensive blockout players. So you teach the mechanics of blocking out. But you also teach if they make the free throw, you teach the player how to get the ball out of bounds fast on the left side or the right side. But what you're doing is you're conditioning, <coughs> excuse me, the mind and the discipline for game preparation. Mm -hmm. The basketball practices is a laboratory. And so it's there that you work on the formula because you know, and I know if you drink a Coca-Cola and the, and the Coca-Cola is not good, you're going to take it back and want your money back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's the same in basketball. If you take your team and you put them on the court and they are, they, they are making mistake after mistake, that's not on the players. That's on you as a coach. So then the practice card that I will uh, give to uh, coaches uh, allows you to put down the date uh, of the practice and also who was there at practice and who was not, who was injured. But also, what did you do during those two, two days of practice? <clears throat> what did you uh, emphasize? What did you teach? Because if you had a game and you turned the ball over 20 times in that game, you lost, and 15 of those turnovers were passes, Then you go back to your practice plan 
and, and, and your laboratory and you go, oh, we did not do any warm-ups in passing. We did not work on bounce passes. We did not work on overhead outlet passes. We did, we did not work on uh, trap step-through passes. So it's a very simple uh, philosophy, uh, Mike Gunner, that, that I, I try to share with the coaches, okay? I'm not reinventing the game, trust me. I don't have all the answers. What I do have is experience. And I think that's what we have to understand, okay? I'm not Picasso, I'm not Michelangelo, okay? I'm coach Tom Newell that's been all over the world and has taught at every level, has worked with young people that had no shoes in Micronesia, all right? Mm -hmm. Yet would be on a basketball court with the sunshine out and wanting to learn and the coaches also. So I, I think that experience uh, and, and the way that I present uh, uh, my philosophy is something that coaches, I don't expect them to receive everything, <coughs> but I am turning the soil, the mind over for the game, for them to be able to absorb and consider and talk amongst themselves. I know that after we finish this uh, Zoom cast, that you and, and uh, Mike are, are going to Gunner, that you and Mike and Mike and Gunner are going to talk about what I just said, because mm -hmm. I'm giving you some new thoughts that perhaps you haven't heard before. And I think that's wonderful because that's what it is. Basketball is a fraternity. And the only way the game grows is when we talk to one another and learn from one another. I'm a student of the game. If I came to your practice, I would learn things from each of you and I would write them down. And then I would also learn uh, how to teach you what you haven't been taught. Mm -hmm. And so that's the beauty of, of being able to grow the game. Yeah. No, that, that's correct. And, and that's, that's like the, the mission of, or, or the philosophy, the vision why we, we started this initiative. Uh, because as you say, F people or coaches shouldn't reinvent basketball. It has been invented multiple times. Let's just share experience from the guys who know the game, who, who play the game, who taught the game. And that's why we do this. And, and talking about yeah, uh, the podcast, you should know, and all the coaches, as soon as this episode ends, I know that Mike will call me five minutes after to discuss about the podcast. So uh, we already do it. And I think it's a great way to share insights because if you say something, coach, yeah, Mike can understand it in another way than I do. And then it's interesting to, to come to a line or, or thought. So uh, I think it's, it's a great idea, a great proposition. So uh, thanks for well, that. Well, just know that you're, you're uh, I, uh, the, the coaches and the players, the students that I have taught in my career, I call them all Newell Jewels, all right? <laughs> They're gems from the gym, G-E-M-S, gems from the gym, which is the title of my book that I will be releasing uh, next year. Okay. And it's, uh, it, it has uh, many uh, references and anecdotes from my MBA coaching and my WNBA coaching and coaching national team in Japan and coaching in Greece. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a kind of book that... Uh, uh, a coach, uh, coaches like yourselves will uh, take into the bathroom if you have a problem with digestion and uh, it will help you uh, relieve the digestion because you'll be laughing so hard at my experiences. Okay, oh, no. it's good that you say that coach and please keep us informed about the publication and uh, the publishing of the book. I will, I promise. And, and I, I hope to come back on anytime that you wish. If you give me advance notice, uh, I would be happy to visit with you uh, I want you to understand something, uh, uh, Gunner and Mike, that is really important. Right now, Game Within the Game, Tom Johnson and myself and uh, uh, Xander Geertz, uh, who is also a, 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 a team member of, of uh, Game Within the Game, uh, we are planting the seeds of the passion fruit tree. Okay. And that the caretakers are the coaches, the parents, Okay, and the players themselves, they are the ones, if they're positive and reinforce, all right, the effort, not how good the shot looked, not how good the, the between the legs move, you know, a Steph Curry move, uh, but, but the effort at both ends of the court, because that is a statistic that is never analyzed, but is always acknowledged by an opponent and by uh, teammates, coaches, 
on the other team and your own team. Yeah. Coach, you, you just told us about the experience. You have the WNBA, the NBA experience, <laughs> but you also were, were coaching in, in Europe. What is the biggest difference between the NBA and Europe basketball? Uh, it begins with uh, management. Okay. Okay. I, I've, uh, I coached in China and I've had a general manager in the CBA Pro League <coughs> come into our, our locker room when we I was, I was coaching in Changchun, the Zilin Tigers. And the general manager came into our locker room uh, upset drunk drunk and uh, went off on uh, all the all the players on the players he didn't say anything to me or the other coaches but he was attacking the players uh, in chinese not the american players but in chinese the chinese players and all the chinese players were like this just had their head down and and, and that custom uh, when somebody in authority addresses you you're you're not allowed to look at them You have to be in this humbled state. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that really bothered me big time. And, and uh, yeah, I didn't say anything uh, because they have censure in China. Uh, I saw some human rights issues that bothered me. They uh, cut me off the internet. Uh, I wrote about it, uh, sent it to another friend from a, an a, a international hotel. Uh, obviously they, they didn't catch it. And so it got posted. Uh, But, you know, I, I just, like I say, I've seen some uh, really incredible things and it all begins with management. Mm -hmm. If you don't have good support, <coughs> excuse me, as a coach, you will not be successful because you have no control over who your players are that you're becoming in charge of. Mm -hmm. You don't know what their habits are. You don't know what they believe or what they don't believe. You don't know who they're listening to besides you being the leader. And so it makes it very difficult in a short period of time to be able to have success. And so philosophically, it's very important for coaches to understand there are three parts to a season, the beginning, the middle, and the end. So when you have a new team, it's a new voice. And you may have two or three new players that don't know one another. And their skills may not be to the level that you as a coach, all right, expect or demand. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be, uh, uh, when I do a clinic, I always hand out in my clinic a rubber band. And I ask the coaches, why, uh, why do you think I give you this rubber band to, to, to wear? Because I wear one. Come out. There you go. Can you see it? Yeah. Yes. yeah. Okay. So I say, why, why do you think I give you a rubber band? My hands go up, up to, uh, uh, for good luck to remind you for good luck or not to forget something. And I said, ah, yes, you're right. Basketball is a game of adjustments. You must be flexible because if you're not, all right, there will be problems, all right? And one of my stories in the book is about an exhibition game, a preseason game uh, when I was with the Sonics, Seattle Sonics, and we were playing against the Los Angeles Clippers. And so we're playing at a college in Los Angeles And it's the last game of the preseason. Gene Shue is the coach of the, of the Clippers at the time. Bernie Bickerstaff is the head coach. And so I'm sitting on the bench and watching the Clippers warm up. And they had a, a young center by the name of Benoit Benjamin. And I'm watching him do layups. And I notice that he has on two left shoes. Okay. And you have to understand he's only wearing a size 22. <laughs> So he goes up and he goes down. And, and, uh, and so I say to uh, Bernie Bickerstaff, the head coach, I said, Bernie, <coughs> take a look at Ber uh, Benoit right now. Watch him uh, when he does his layups. And Bernie goes, Tommy, why do I want to look at him? And I said, no, no, just take a look. So he watches. He comes over. He says, I don't believe it. He's wearing two left shoes. I said, I know. And he's playing. So he immediately goes over to the other coach before the game and tells him about Benoit wearing two left shoes. Nobody knew on his team, all right? The coach didn't know. <clears throat> and he thanks Bernie and he calls Benoit over. And so they have me and I'm watching. Bernie goes, hey, Tommy, uh, Gene didn't even know. 
that he was wearing two left shoes. And, and he says, thank you. So anyway, <coughs> here Benoit is seven feet one and Gene Shu is uh, one meter 90. And, uh, and you see Gene looking up at him and, and Benoit looking down at his shoes and they're talking about two or three minutes. Benoit leaves and goes back to the locker room. Gene comes over and Bernie gets up. Game, you know, is going to start in about five minutes. And he goes, Bernie, you're not going to believe this. Benoit left his house because the game is in Los Angeles, left his house and, and uh, asked his girlfriend to put his shoes into his bag. Well, you know, uh, most girls wear a small shoe. And so when she hears him say two white shoes, she's going to take two white shoes and put them in the bag. So she put two white size 22 shoes okay, that, that ended up in the bag. He goes to the locker room. He's got his uniform on. He got taped up, all right, puts on his, uh, his first left shoe, <clears throat> goes to put on his right shoe, looks around and realizes that he's got two left shoes. Doesn't say anything to anybody. <clears throat> Loosens his shoe up, ties it, goes into the bathroom, comes back, you know, does some little uh, lifts and whatever before they go on the court and then realizes, all right, nobody noticed. So he says to himself, well, I'm going to go try to see if I can do layups. Okay, and take some shots and see how it goes. So that's what he did until I saw it. And so the story, the, the, the moral of the story is we're a rubber band because <laughs> you never know when players are going to show up late for practice uh, or may not show up uh, or end up showing up with uh, two pairs of shoes uh, or one pair of shoe, the same, the, 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 the same size and, and uh, you know, the same left or right, right it, pair. It's really funny because last week I was, was here at home and I, I changed my shoes for, for, <laughs> for fun. Really, it's not... A, It's it's really difficult to walk on it, so I, I can imagine if you have to warm up with two left shoes, not possible. <laughs> That's good that you share that because all those that are watching this now are, are realizing, all right, just how open you are as a coach. All right, yeah. be honest about that. Of If you course. want another funny story, may I share that, Gunner? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Coach. Okay, I'm coaching in New Jersey. <clears throat> I'm the assistant coach, along with Rick Carlisle, who's the former coach of the Mavericks, and now the current coach of the Pacers. And so we're playing against Charlotte. I, I think it was Charlotte. And I'm in charge of the defense. And so uh, I've been there about four months now. And, and uh, you know, after games, we would go uh, uh, out to uh, get something to eat after the game. You know, a small bite or Bill Fitch was the head coach. He liked to get you know, some uh, lemon meringue pie or a milkshake or something like that. And so we have a timeout and Rick would always stand up and then Bill would kneel down and then I would kneel down also to go over the defensive adjustments. So anyway, Bill's upset and he's drawing a play on offense. And as I go down to kneel down, I open, I don't pull my, my pants up And I kneel down over my legs and I split my pants. Well, you can imagine what comes out. So here the players are looking at me and I'm, I'm revealing nature to the players during this critical timeout. And, there's, and they start laughing. Well, there, there are a bunch of players who don't know what the players are laughing about. Bill Fitch is writing the play and he looks up and he sees them laughing. <coughs> Nobody says anything. And so Drazen Petrovic, all right, who was on the team at the time, shaking his head, he can't believe it. And, and so Fish gets up and he, he throws the clipboard underneath the bench and walks away. The players come up and pat me on the back and say, it's okay, coach, it's okay. All right, we didn't see it all. And so anyway, they go back out on the court and uh, Rick goes, what was that all about? Why, why were the players laughing? And so I said, Rick, lean over and take a look because I took a towel and put it and kept my legs together and put the towel <coughs> over one of my legs. I said, Rick, lean over and take a look between my legs. He goes, what? I said, just do it. So he leans over and takes a look and he starts shaking his head and he's laughing. 
Bill Fish sees this, walks down, and, and I see he's really mad. He's red, and I get up, and I say, Coach, it's all right. It's my, my fault. So what the hell are you guys laughing about? What's going on? I said, Coach, when I was kneeling down to talk to him about defense, my pants split open. And he goes, damn it, Tommy, that's the last time we're going out to dinner after games. <laughs> so so I, ended up, I ended up losing 10 pounds that season. And, uh, uh, but the, the funny story was, is that I gave my pants to the trainer at halftime. And he told me he would sew them up. And so here I am going over our defense in my boxer shorts, my tie and my shirt, and my, my shoes and my socks. I have no pants on. And I'm drawing how we're going to do our matchups and assignments. And uh, the, so it's over with. The players are going out on the court, and I'm waiting for my pants to come back. The trainer goes, hey, coach, I apologize. I could not uh, uh, sew your pants because two players had to get retaped. But I, I did staple it together. Are you there? Yeah. yeah. Okay. My battery's getting low, but, but that's all right. I'll get uh, more power. And yeah. so uh, he goes, it should be all right. So I put my pants on and try to imagine staples rubbing against your, the inside of your leg. Okay. Yeah. I had, I had so many uh, uh, scratches. So it's fourth quarter. All right. No problems. Okay. We've had three timeouts in the second half. Now it's a close game. All right, and I'm really excited because we got to get a defensive stop. All right, I kneel down, and and all of a sudden you hear this, and I completely split open the pants again. And Bill Fish leans over and he goes, "We better get a stop. We better get a stop." It's, we won the game, but that's one of my stories in the book. Yeah, that's oh, no, great, great story, Coach. Thanks for sharing. You're welcome. Uh, um, yeah. During the last story, Coach, you mentioned the name, uh, which is a special name for both Mike and I because we were true fans. And I think it's a pity that we were still young kids, but it's Drazen Petrovic. Um, oh. You worked with the, with the guy. Um, for me, it's special because he, he died on uh, June the 7th, uh, which is my birthday. So uh, each year I, I think about it. And yeah, each year again, I think it's, it's a pity that, that, that I was only five years old when he was in his prime. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about how he was as a player when you were there? Well, uh, I'm getting my power source right now. So hold on. Uh, yeah. One of the things that I can tell you uh, about Drazen is that not many people know this, uh, but Rick Carlisle and myself, hold on. Hold on here. I'm trying to get more power. Yeah, take, take your time. My, my assistant is helping me here. <laughs> Bravo. Merci. Oop, excuse me. All right. And I'm sure that uh, Mike will be able to edit out this uh, momentary pause here. <laughs> All right. So. This is a great story, and, and uh, not many people know this, but uh, Petrovic was traded to us from uh, Portland, mm -hmm. and uh, Bill Fitch uh, is an ex-military uh, uh, Marine, and he, uh, <coughs> excuse me, and he was really tough on Petro. He, he wanted him to, to play better defense and, you know, make an effort, and so about Oh, three weeks into it, after he got a chance to, to play with new players and what have you, we stayed in the same condominium uh, complex in New Jersey. And uh, he called me up and he said, uh, Coach, I need to talk to you. And I go, OK. So I go up to his uh, condominium and I walk in and he's got these boxes that he's packed. And he's got on CNN. And at the time, they were showing the, uh, the Serbian uh, incursion into Croatia. Yeah. And uh, he was really upset, extremely upset. And he had already had a falling out with uh, Vladi Divic, uh, who was with the Lakers and then Sacramento. And uh, he started out with Charlotte. But, uh, and, and, you know, Draw spoke, you know, four different languages, extremely intelligent uh, person. 
And he said, uh, Coach, uh, you know, I, I, can't, I can't play here. The, 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 the players and the coaches don't understand my game. And so I just listened to him. And he talked and he talked. And, and, uh, and so I said, well, what, what's really bothering you, Dross? And he goes, the car that I, uh, I, I, I when I was most valuable player in, in uh, Europe, I was given uh, a Porsche. And uh, I think it was a 948 or something. It was a really expensive Porsche for being most valuable player. And he parked it in his mother's uh, uh, garage and it was up on blocks. And uh, I'm trying to, I think it was in Zagreb, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was Zagreb. Uh, but anyway, he, he said that it was stolen. And he was really, really upset about it uh, because he felt it was a personal attack on him and his family. And so then uh, he got that out. You know, we talked about that. And I said, you know, that, that you're right, that's wrong. And, and, but most important thing is your mother's safe and your family. And he said, yes. I said, then don't, don't, the car is nothing. Okay, mm -hmm. life is more important than uh, having a fast car, a turbo. And so we, we laughed at that. And then I said, uh, Draz, let's go to let's go to dinner tonight. OK, don't don't make any reservations. Don't make any plans. Let's just go to dinner. All right. I'll call Rick and we'll meet <coughs> and we'll go to this really nice Italian restaurant and we'll go early when nobody's there. And so I called the restaurant to find out uh, if they were open by five o'clock. They normally open at six, but they knew who we were as coaches and players and the, uh, the owner, you know, really liked the basketball. And so we got there. Uh, Rick came from uh, New York. He was uh, living over in New York at the time. No, he was in New Jersey too, but he was living in a different uh, village, a different city. So uh, I brought draws and, and uh, we sat down and, and uh, we started to talk and I explained to Rick what was going on uh, so that, that he understood. I did not want him to say anything to Bill Fitch yet. Mm -hmm. Uh, I wanted, uh, because I didn't want Bill to have any interference with Drazen's uh, mentality at that time. Mm -hmm. He was just very, very uh, emotionally upset. And, but he needed to be able to talk for somebody to listen to him and really hear uh, exactly what he was saying. So <clears throat> Rick ended up <clears throat> going, oh man, this is unbelievable. Uh, and so what I said to, to, to Draz, uh, and Rick was really good too, is that, you know, don't, don't give up, okay? You're a very, very important player in basketball. And, and that, that what you demonstrate uh, on the court and, and the way you play is going to take basketball to another level for all players. And, and, and Rick was really good, you know, and we're very supportive of, of uh, <coughs> Drazen. He worked with them. You know, uh, uh, after practices, uh, you know, I worked with Roz as well, but Rick had developed a really good uh, uh, close relationship with him. And so after dinner, uh, Roz agreed that he would sleep on it. And, uh, you know, and then the next day he would make a, a decision. Well, it turned out that uh, I ended up you know, calling coach and letting him know what was going on. And, and uh, he said he already knew because of his agent. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he also knew that he had dinner with us and he was waiting for our report. Well, I talked to the coach before Rick did and I explained to him, you know, what the concerns were and that Draws was a different type of player in his career that didn't have somebody that was always pointing out his mistakes mm -hmm. and in front of others. You know, and, and because he was in Portland playing with a really good team there, but he, you know, never got to play because Danny Age was always ahead of him. And I always felt that Danny Age, you know, had uh, not had basically retired from the Celtics and, and uh, grew up in Oregon and Portland and got a couple of years uh, extra money in his pocket to play basketball in Portland. Uh, but was not the same uh, effective player that Drazen could have been mm -hmm. had they uh, played Drazen in uh, the finals uh, the year before. So long story short, Drazen uh, overcame uh, the adversity. It turned out uh, a week later, 
the people that stole his car were rebels, all right? Croatian rebels fighting against the Serbians at the time. And so that made him feel really good. <coughs> he just wanted to know if they got enough guns and ammunition <laughs> at the time. True good. story. Good. Yeah. You're talking a lot about um, communication now. I think it's something very important for you, the communication between you as a coach or a trainer and your players. Correct? Absolutely. 100%. And how... Where is the line? Because you have a, a line of you, you're the coach and they're the players. How do you put the line where it is? There's, there's, there's no line. It, it no? all begins in the beginning <clears throat> when you receive your players. You know, mm -hmm. think about a teacher. A teacher assigns seats alphabetically or by height. Uh, in some cases, uh, you know, by color. Uh, <clears throat> and that's, that's not right. Uh, What, what I try to do, I, I, I uh, and at the clinic, I will, sh I will uh, pass out uh, questionnaires. As a coach, I want to know if a player has had a bad experience before in sports. Mm -hmm. And I want to know why. I want to know what, what was the problem that you had with the previous coach? Or what was the bad experience that you had? Mm -hmm. Because that will help me understand the player's mentality confidence or no confidence and 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 <clears throat> more importantly if a parent was overbearing <clears throat> excuse me you have a lot of parents that played basketball mm -hmm. but never taught the game mm -hmm. but they have a voice to tell their son or daughter this is what you need to do and sometimes yell that from the stands is that a good habit or a bad habit it's a terrible habit mm -hmm. because the parent is a distraction Do you ever see parents in a, in a uh, orchestra uh, as spectators, parents watching their sons or daughters, okay, and, and uh, yelling out, you missed the note, that's wrong. No. So why, why would a parent embarrass their child, all right, when they miss a shot or make a mistake? I, that I don't understand. Conversely, why would a coach do the same thing? The player knows he made a mistake, All right, the picture was taken. It doesn't have to be passed around. All right, so let's move on. Mistakes are part of the game of basketball. You mm -hmm. learn from them. The most important thing is you don't want to make the same mistake twice. Yes. Correct. No, that's correct. Success comes from failure. Hey, that's very good. I like that. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, getting back to what Mike asked, it, it's that, If you don't know your player's psyche, especially coming out of COVID and they gain weight, all right? They missed two years of structure and conditioning because of isolation and lockdown. If you as a coach and not a teacher first, if you don't understand the imposition and, and the adversity that they suffered because maybe the mother and father lost their job uh, or maybe the father Uh, became very depressed because he didn't have work. He didn't have money to support mm -hmm. the family. And so, you know, they had birthdays. They couldn't celebrate. Uh, he couldn't get a new pair of shoes, <coughs> even though his feet have grown another inch. There's so many negative things that have influenced the children that want to participate and play basketball. So if the learning environment is not positive, and if you as a coach do not understand where they've come from, And, and how this is basically a recreation activity to, to learn and enjoy again, then, then the coach is wrong. And, and it's all 100% wrong. And the players will exhibit that when they play. No, 100% correct. That's correct, that's correct. Um, coach, um, I just said it, one, a quote, uh, you know, most of us coaches, we all have like favorite quotes about basketball or life. Do you have any quotes? Oh, I got a couple for you. One is uh, kids and youth sports today. And I wrote this uh, 1998. <clears throat> and it goes kids and sports today, not just basketball, but kids and sport and youth sports today. 1998. Kids want to play, play, play. Coaches want to practice, practice, practice. Parents want to win, win, win. And officials want to quit, quit, quit. <laughs> oh, 
it's uh, true, no? <clears throat> I think Mike can relate because uh, two of his brothers are referees, so. Uh... <laughs> so perhaps I can get you to translate that, send it to me, and I'll put it on my handout. <laughs> yeah. the, uh, the other, the other quote I have is uh, it's called dreams. And uh, I wrote this on the way back from uh, New Jersey after losing out as head coach candidate to Chuck Daly in uh, 1993. And I don't know why, he was only the dream team coach. Uh, he wanted uh, $3 million a year. I told Willis Reed, the general manager, I'll take $300,000 and you can spread it out over five years. But uh, at that time we had seven owners who all wanted to sell the team and felt that uh, getting Chuck Daly would really help uh, the attendance, which it did, and also get a, a really well-known coach and an excellent teacher and, and just an excellent manager of personalities, uh, probably the best I've ever seen at the professional level, uh, more so than uh, Popovich uh, uh, or, or Phil Jackson. Uh, I, I think uh, people don't realize the genius of uh, Chuck Daly, and, and I just have tremendous respect for, for how he managed the dream team in uh, 1992. So I'm on the plane, <clears throat> obviously disappointed, but I'm a very reflective person. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm sitting there and I write this poem called Dreams. And it goes like this, a dream is a wish much better than any fantasy. The only problem is the time it takes to become a reality. And so then in 1995, I became a, a head coach in uh, Iraklis in Thessalonique. And, uh, and, and so, you know, I, I experienced that emotion of being a head coach, but I also experienced uh, the lesson from uh, bad management. And, uh, and so that was uh, an experience that I never forgot about. And, uh, you know, I, I, I released it, but you never forget. And so when you asked me the question earlier about what's, a, what's the difference between Europe and NBA and WNBA, it begins with management. If you, if you have somebody in management that, that does not communicate and does not share the same philosophy as you do in, in developing a team and understanding the three parts of the season, the beginning, the middle, and the end, mm -hmm. <clears throat> progressively, you have no chance of succeeding to yeah. this day especially after COVID, because adults in their pre-COVID minds are trying to dismiss what happened to their lives, being suspended, to vaccinations, to mask mandates, to not being able to work. Uh, just everything has changed. It's a whole new normal now. Everything is new, and it begins with the mind. It doesn't begin with the automobiles. It doesn't begin with the clothes you wear, or the bling you wear. It begins with the mind. And until we as a, as a species, as human beings, as adults, uh, supervising and leading children, all right, out of COVIDness, especially in sport, then there will always be a problem. Okay, so, so in your opinion, eh, when it comes to philosophy, eh, management and a coach should breed as one, or so any other... I'm sorry, you broke up there. Could you repeat that? Oh, please? okay. So, so when it comes to philosophy uh, within a, within a club, I think a management and a coach should breed as one. Yes. Yeah. That's Always. How, that's what you said. Uh, I, I, I'm going to ask you both this question, and, and uh, Mike, you can edit it out, or Gunnar, you can edit it out. <coughs> When's the last time you sat down and wrote your philosophy in basketball yourself? We you just sat down. Okay, you just, you wrote things out. Your offensive philosophy, your defensive philosophy, your team philosophy, your rules, all right? Player development philosophy, parents, okay? Management, okay? New players philosophy. When's the last time you both did that? And you can edit this out. I'm just asking no, I don't you. have to edit out. I think we, we, we forget some things. I, I did it last uh, for in the beginning of the season in um, July. But for me, it was only the offensive and the defensive philosophy and some rules and some uh, points that I want to do with my team. Uh, but like not with the, the, the management and everything. 
this philosophy I didn't write down. So something interesting to think about. Well, yeah, it is, uh, uh, Mike, because if you don't understand that management is part of your team, mm -hmm. okay, and they just, they hire you to fire you, all right, based on wins and losses, if you're able to make them understand <clears throat> that you're a teacher, all right, and be able to prepare them to visualize how to develop mm -hmm. success, then they will never comprehend. They'll always judge you, all right, by the W's and L's. <coughs> so, <coughs> excuse me. So it's really important, very, very important that you take all aspects that's related to the game mm -hmm. as part of your team, your team, not their team, your team. They hired you to do a job, okay? So if they hired you to be a coach and that's all you do is coach, all right, then you will not be successful. You'll just rotate to every team, okay? And they'll hire you because you're a nice guy and you can drink beer with the committee afterwards, okay? But in the end, they'll fire you because you're not successful. But if you have your philosophy and you sit down and you share that, okay? And I'll give you an example. In Belgium, to get a diploma A and B, you have to submit your theory, your thesis, you have to go through a process of evaluation by a committee. So it's very important that you explain in a transparent way that you explain everything about your belief in developing players mm -hmm. and, and uh, uh, developing your offense and your defense, overcoming adversity when you have one player, two players that are in your rotation get hurt. And why player development is so important. So those, those uh, seven and eight players or ninth and 10th players that don't play a lot, all of a sudden, they have to. excuse me, get an opportunity to play. Well, if you haven't taught them, then guess what? They're going to play poorly. The team will play poorly. And who does that reflect on? Management? No. The players? No. It reflects on you. Yes, that's true. No, I'm giving you some really good stuff here. I hope you realize that. Yeah, that's why we recorded. <laughs> hey, now I'm going to give you another gym from the gym. All right, are you ready? Yeah. yeah. And this is going to blow you away. Nobody has ever taught this. In my lifetime of basketball, as a former player and uh, coach in the NBA and Europe and, and uh, Asia, <clears throat> I have evaluated thousands of players, not hundreds, thousands of players by, by visual and audiovisual, by videotape, uh, by YouTube. And I've broken it down in my evaluation very simply. There are 30 watt bulb players, <clears throat> there are 60 watt bulb players, there are 90 watt bulb players, and they're halogens. Do you know what a 30 watt bulb player is? You know, no. on a light bulb, you have a low, a low light, right? Yeah. yeah. That's a 30 watt. A 60 watt, you might have in the bathroom because you want to make sure you look good before you go out. Okay. A 90 watt bulb, okay, is a porch light. All right. So you don't fall down the stairs. The halogen, all right, is that big light that, that shines on the, uh, the, the MMA and the boxing ring. Yeah but it also illuminates other people around that center point. So the 30 watt bulb player is that player that shows up for practice, never a problem, okay? Is, is always giving the best effort, but that's it. They don't put anything back into getting better, mm -hmm. but they have enough skill <coughs> to be on the team, all right? They're not a problem in the locker room afterwards. Or I didn't get to play, you know, or give dirty looks. But they're really good team players. I call them butterflies, okay? Mm -hmm. The 60-watt bowl player is that player that has talent, that has some athleticism, that has a good mind for the game, but no experience. And so makes mistakes in practice and makes mistakes in games, but is learning from them. And, and is just so eager that's sitting at the dinner table and just is, keeps eating and wants more. 
okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and there's not enough time to practice with that player and train that player. Okay, you follow me? Yeah. yeah. And then the 90 wild ball player is that player that plays in 30 games and 22 or 23 games, double double. Fantastic. Rebound, block shots, assists, steals, uh, points scored. Uh, it's just, you know, leads the team. But there's seven or eight games where they are missing an action. Why? Well, because maybe there's a problem at home or a girlfriend or a boyfriend or a problem with the, the mother and father having a, a, a confrontation, a dispute, or maybe they had a problem in school and they didn't do well on examination. Okay, so they're affected, all right? And, and, and in the game, they pick up two quick fouls and they come off the court with their head down. They wanna sit at the end of the bench because they're so upset, okay? And so they try to find the, the, the furthest seat away from the coach, yeah. okay? Because they don't wanna hear anything, okay? Because yeah. it's all about me right now, okay? Woe is me, all right? Or during the game, you see that they were open for a shot. And <clears throat> another player took the shot and didn't pass to them. Hey, what's the problem? What's the problem? Of you know, and, and so right away, you notice that the personality has changed, all right? I have always called a timeout immediately. Whenever I see any of that, I always call a timeout. Wherever country I've... I've coached in. If I saw any player, foreign or American, all right, disrespect their teammate during a game, I called a timeout, all right? Because to me, that was a teaching moment and a coaching moment, okay? We do not do that, all right? That's unacceptable. You do not sit at the end of the bench. And I actually did this uh, coaching my son's team in the eighth grade one year. We had a player, a really good player, played college, played in Spain. He ended up, all right, uh, shooting really bad from the outside and uh, picked up two fouls. I had to take him out of the game. I knew exactly what was going to happen before it happened. All right, I saw his expression. I didn't take a timeout. I took a water bottle and I put it on the last two seats of the bench, okay, the chairs, okay, because I knew he was going to go down there and sit, all right? Sure enough, I take him out of the game. He goes down and he, and he sits down and he jumps up and he starts blaming his teammate for water being on the bench. I walk down and I go, what's the problem? Look at this. He put water on. I said, how do you know he put water on the bench? Well, he's the closest one to it. And he's got a water bottle in his hand. Did you ask him? No, I just know he did. No, he didn't. What is my rule? All right. What is the team rule? coming out of the game you're supposed to let your teammate know who he's guarding or who she's guarding and when you go by the bench you have your head up you don't have your head down all right because there's still a game and you're part of the team and so he goes well what do you mean I said I put the water on the bench so when your pants dry you can get back in the game <laughs> he went to the bathroom Good. <laughs> this is really <laughs> this is a really good story because when you started this story and telling, I was already smiling. And I think Gunnar knows why I'm smiling. I have one player like this. Really, he's a really good player. But when I when he don't get the ball from a player, from a teammate, he can do, hey, why, why? I'm open. And the story about uh, sitting on the bench, he's also like this. When there's there's something bad, he's going to sit on the bench. Really, I'm One day I'm gonna do the same like you and put one <laughs> on the bench and to see this really good, good. story. Good. So so now we go to the halogen. Yeah. The, the 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 bright light, the John Stocktons, the Michael Jordans, all right, the uh, Steph Curry's, uh, <clears throat> Larry Bird's, uh, Jerry West, all the great uh, players that led their team to uh, successful seasons. <coughs> Those are the players that, that arrived before the, uh, the time to be. So if you, you have your players be in the locker room an hour or an hour and a half before the game, they're there and they're all ready to go. And, and they're sitting uh, in the front there looking at the, at the board, the whiteboard, what the coach is writing down as reminders on offense and defense. 
and they 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 are an extension of the coach on the court during the game and and they illuminate everybody else by by their compliments by their support uh and, and making sure that if they make a mistake hey it's all right no no problem or if they make a mistake all right they made a, i made a bad pass to you uh gunner mm -hmm. you know and you look at me you know like, ah and i go hey don't worry it's my my bad my bad Okay, because that releases you from feeling like you let me down because perhaps maybe I'm the better player and I, I made you a pass and you didn't catch it because you weren't ready. It's all right. It's one play. Don't worry about it. Okay, because I know you're going to play defense and help me on defense at the other end. And mm -hmm. I need you as my teammate. And so that that's what the halogen does. Okay, he, he's an extension of the coach out of the timeout. The next time you watch an NBA game, Take a look at, after the timeout, how certain player will bring his team together to remind them, all right, this is what we're doing, okay? And when you see that as a coach, your, your heart just is like, oh, man, this is awesome, okay? Mm -hmm. It really is. Uh, and and, I, and that's, that's my levels of illumination that I share with yeah. coaches in games. And, and in Russia, where I've been, I've had 80 coaches, all right? 60 of them have 30 watts, 60 watt. All right. Maybe 10 had 90 watt. All right. And only two would answer to having halogens. Think about that. And that was yeah. translated. And I drew the light bulbs on a whiteboard so they would understand. So, you know, <clears throat> I said before, I'm not, I'm not Picasso. I'm not Michelangelo. I'm a little bit, little bit you know, like Bruce Lee, be like water. Uh, but but I, I have a sincerity and a passion to want to share with, with both of you, with both of you, so that you can grow the game and we can grow the game together. I'm not going to be around, you know, uh, another 10 years or so. I, I know my, my age, my time. But while I am here and, and while there are people that wish to learn, I will always serve. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a great, a great attitude, a great mentality that you show there, Coach. Uh, no, thanks for sharing the story. It's a, it's a great one to reflect on as coaches. So uh, I will I will keep that in mind, definitely. Good, so, uh, good, Gunner. Good, great, great. Good, Michael. Thank you, thank you, Coach. Coach, and welcome. Hey, it's from my heart. No, peace, love, and basketball. Great one. Booyah. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's, that's my international saying to, uh, <clears throat> to all the kids is I, I, I always get them together and, and I go, we don't go one, two, three team. I go, when they do something well, all right, and for the first time or whatever with their effort, I go, booyah, and that's B-O-O-H-L-Y-A-H. -H. And so uh, I, I did this in, uh, in, in uh, the Philippines and I, I did this in uh, uh, South America and then Japan, I would go booyah and they'd all come together booyah and so it was just it was a wonderful uh, just a wonderful experience and I can't tell you when kids see me all right they identify me by the booyah coach yeah no that's great that's like uh, your signature then um, and coach talking about the kids and uh, and you, you're, you're, you're very known in your community for uh, uh, delivering uh, basketball camps and cl clinics for kids ages. What are the, the, the main focus points during those, those camps? I, uh, the first thing I tell them is, is that I can help you with your mistakes, but I can do nothing with your excuses. Good one. So it begins right there. All right. And, and it's very important you understand that. Yeah. Okay. I can help you with your mistakes, but can do nothing with your excuses. Okay. So if they show up late and they want to blame their mother or father, all right, because they couldn't find their shoes or they couldn't find their socks or because they woke up late. And so they had breakfast late. My, all my, all the Newell jewels know, all right, that, that there are no excuses. That's good. Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. So that's the simplicity of Tom Newell. Booyah! <laughs> no, hey, I, hey, Mike, let me hear you say booyah! 
Booyah! Hey! <laughs> All right, Gunner, you're next. Booyah! Oh, that's really good. All right. Yeah, I can see you both uh, do karaoke on uh, Saturday nights. <laughs> After a couple of beers, yes. <laughs> it's good. No, but I, I think that defines you as a coach. Like, uh, just uh, the love, the passion, the sharing, and just keeping it simple. Uh, why making things complex if you can do it uh, in a simple manner? And uh, I think that's a great way, a great yeah, attitude that you show there. And I think our co coaches who are looking today uh, can relate to that. And I think it's a great experience uh, to get in touch with you, coach. Uh, so thanks again. Hey, Gunnar, uh, thank you. I, I mean that sincerely. You know, you're, you both are Newell Jewels. And if I can help you in any way with your team, uh, you know, while I'm here until uh, the 22nd, <clears throat> you know, my, my email address is Coach Tom Newell, N E W E L L, at gmail.com. And I'm happy to answer any coach's query, uh, question, uh, offense, defense, or, or if he's having an issue with parents or what have you. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. All right, and I support you. And uh, anything I can do to help grow the game in Belgium and the world, uh, I'm a humanitarian first, all right? And a really good former left-hand shooter in Belgium. <laughs> yeah. Wow, no, I think this, this, this is huge, Coach. Uh, to all the coaches, uh, if somebody uh, has a problem or an issue or a question for Coach Tom, please do not hesitate to get in touch with us or with him. He will be glad and honored to help you. Uh, so uh, great. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. So and that goes for Tom, Tom Johnson, too, with Game Within the Game. Yeah. Okay. He, he, uh, he subscribes to the same philosophy. And, and, you know, he's going through the same things you are, you know, with mm -hmm. players coming out of COVID this. And it hasn't been easy, you know, especially with the, the bad eating habits. You know, you got to eat right to play right. That's right. That's right. That's, that's part of the other philosophy, okay, that I want you to think about is, is the conditioning, you know, that, that's, that's something that, that I've added, you know, in, in the, the teaching philosophy is, is the conditioning coming out of COVID, you know, because it's a very important issue. You know, you got players that were 11 years old that are 13. You have 14 year olds that are 16. Mm -hmm. And they missed all that, 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 that influence of, of your voice or another mm -hmm. coach's voice and encouragement or not. So everything that is done now is new. This is a new normal in basketball globally. It's a model to follow. Yeah, no, great model. Coach, I think, and Mike will, 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 will agree as well. I think this conversation has been great. It has been- Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. I thank you from my heart and I thank you on behalf of all the children that want to play basketball and all I ask the parents to do is be positive and support their effort don't ever criticize your child in, in a sport and activity especially coming out of COVID <coughs> they want <clears throat> excuse me they want to learn they want to be supported and most of all they want to have fun yeah that's correct and coach maybe to wrap it all up could you give us young coaches one last or a couple of last advice? Yeah. Keep it simple. Don't, don't call players by their last name in practice. Don't, don't make an issue out of something that they did wrong because you didn't teach it. Mm -hmm. Admit your mistakes before players and they will respect you more. And so will the parents because the kids will tell the parents, oh, my coach, he made a mistake today. And he told us. And, and, and that builds the trust and the relationship. Okay, it really does. If you take a job worried about management and worried about parents, then you need to become a swimming coach. Okay? Because you teach your players how to swim or they'll drown. Okay? Wow. So, and the great thing about swimming, and I, I've told this to young kids before, is that if, if you don't like coaches yelling at you, all right, take up swimming because you can always put your head under the water and swim. 
and not hear the negative words coming towards you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, that's correct. No, thanks. Thanks, coach. Uh, yeah, once again, I, I said it the, uh, several times before. Thanks a lot for taking No problems, Gunner. Sunday. Thanks a lot, coach. You really bet. You bet. Gunner, I hope to meet you personally, too, before I leave. I yeah. would love to. I would love to have a, a, jubil, a jubilee uh, beer with both of you sometime. Okay. No, I'll, I'll, I'll write it down that Mike and I get in touch with you before the 22nd of November and uh, grab a beer and talk about basketball and life. And I'll bring, I'll bring my ring, my championship ring from the Dallas Mavericks oh. that was given to me by Rick Carlisle, not as a coach. Okay. But he gave it to me as an acknowledgement for he was one of my uh, first students in college. And then we coached together and I encouraged him to get into coaching. And so I introduced him to my father. And Rick became part of the training camp uh, during the summer, the big man's camp. He knew a big man's camp. Wow. And from there, his career evolved. And that was his way of saying thank you. And on the inside of the ring, it says, thanks. Thanks, Tom. RC. And so. It's worth a lot of box tops from uh, cereals, okay? Yeah. So uh, anyway, I'll, I'll be happy to share it with you both. No, I'm, I'm looking forward to see it. Yeah, like okay. me too. All right, Thanks thank lot, you. Coach. Take care. And, uh... Don't you well, don't you well. <laughs> you're Thank you, coach. Talk to you soon, coach. Okay, bye-bye. Right. Bedankt om te luisteren naar de Hurl. Elke week nodigen wij coaches uit om hun visie over basketbal en coaching te delen met jullie. Op die manier kunnen coaches hun filosofie verruimen. Volgende week komt er een Belgische coach die momenteel aan de slag is in Duitsland. Olivier Foucault is de assistant coach van Roel Moors bij BC Göttingen. Met coach Foucault gaan we dieper in over zijn rol als assistant coach en hoe belangrijk het stunten in het hedendaags basketbal is geworden. Vergeet zeker niet onze pagina te liken om up-to-date te blijven van alle type of nieuws.